Uh, okay, should I introduce? You should introduce yeah, yourself, I feel like. That oh, everyone knows me. I at need this point. no introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, it's your podcast. You know, I don't tell me. Yeah, but I am here with a friend and fellow Rhode Island historian. We're going to discuss object number 15. Oh. Pretty sure it's 15. The Newport Spirit Bundle, or Inkisi, as it's properly called. And I'm here with Michael J. Simpson, who if you have been listening for a long time, you'll know him. PhD student in early American history at Brown University in Providence. And you are focusing your research plan on Rhode Island and the transatlantic slave trade and its connection to the American Revolution. So welcome, Michael. Thank you for having me. So I actually was thinking for a while I would discuss this object in my series. And it's something that I saw briefly in person before it was spirited away, oh, you could I say. See, I see what you did there. <laughs> but so you saw it in Newport. I saw it in Newport oh. in the Wanton Lyman Hazard House oh, wow. before it disappeared into the archive of the Smithsonian Institution. Mm. But, Michael, you have done more research and dug more deeply into the legacy of the slave trade, the African population in Rhode Island, and their material culture. So it was clear you were the perfect person to consult with on this subject. So we'll talk about this object and as usual we'll use it as a jumping off point to talk about all the kind of themes and phenomena around it and connected to it. So let's say we start off with just describing the thing itself. So it basically is a little bundle tied together with cloth with various small objects in it that if I recall correctly, and you may, you may know as well as I do, it was found under the floorboards of a closet on the upper floor of the Wanton Lyman Hazard House in Newport. Mm -hmm. Sounds good to me. Sounds about right. So what is, what is a spirit bundle? Well, let's take a step back. It was found, do you know when it was found? 2000. Was that recent? 2005, 2006. Wow. Yeah. So it had been sitting there for an extended period Probably of time. Probably around 300 years or so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Before it was uncovered. Uh, and so when we think of, you know, hidden histories, this was a perfect example of that. Um and uh, yeah, so the spirit the spirit bundle is something that comes from Congolese people, which was now kind of called the Congolese people, and it is a protection. I think in this instance, it is used for protection, um, and it's meant to protect the people of the home from uh, negative and, and bad spirits. And yeah, and I think that, well, I guess we'll go into this a little bit deeper, but I think that what this shows is that this was not necessarily what we would now call an African-American, but like a definitely a Congolese person coming directly from Africa rather than maybe the descendant of someone uh, from the Congo. Yeah, well, and certainly when we're talking about Newport in the 18th century, most of the people of African descent there were actually African-born. It was not yet a time when you had a big population of American-born Black Americans. So it makes sense to suppose that probably this dates back to the 18th century, maybe the early 18th century, and it's likely that the person who created it and put it under the floorboards was probably from Africa. And spirit bundles, they've been found in America. And they, mm, they've, yep. it's a practice that's evolved over the years. But it seems to have precursors and roots in Congo, right. which is a name for this sort of broad region that was all part of a sort of expansive kingdom mm -hmm in West Central Africa, mm -hmm. right? So areas that we would today call Democratic Republic of Congo, exactly. Angola, mm -hmm. and so on. A certain, a pretty sizable portion of the African captives who were brought to America were from Congo. It was a pretty big source. Mm -hmm. And as some people have pointed out, it's sort of overlooked sometimes that people talk more about West Africa, mm -hmm. which was also a big origin point of the slave trade mm -hmm. areas like you know the gold coast benin but congo was a big one too and there seems to be this 
long-standing practice in Congo of creating what they call inkisi, mm-hmm. right? N-K-I-S-I, or plural, minkisi. Mm-hmm. So uh, so what, what what is an inkisi? How would you describe that? Yeah, I mean, I think a spirit bundle is a, is a good uh, way of describing it. It's going to be, there are instances where there can be used kind of in the way in which we think of like a, a voodoo doll now today, where you kind of use it in the opposite of um, protection. You use it for harm in the sense that you're still protecting maybe oneself from someone who would cause you harm. But it also, I think, can, it can be used in, in this sense, which I think is, was used uh, in the Wanton Lyman Hazard House, uh, which was for protection. And in this case, it was wrapped in this particular cloth, mm-hmm. uh, which, you know, I think one of the uh, things that really needs to be done with this object is a full archaeological survey of the object itself to kind of try and find, I mean, find the, the location of this cloth specifically, I think, would be the easiest place to start. There's a nail, mm. I think, would also be a good place to start. And then the cowrie shell... Um, would be really interesting to see if we could figure out where where that actually came from. But anyway, all of those were encased in this bundle, I believe encased in this fabric, and just over the course of four, uh, 300 years, that fabric kind of fell apart, and that was the only remnants in 2006 when they found it. And when if we look at the Newport Historical Society's little note about the bundle, they give a little brief listing of what was in it, but they don't go into much detail. And they say it contained, quote, several layers of cloth, beads, pins, broken glass, and most diagnostically, a carved African cowrie shell. Mm -hmm. So we can suppose that, you know, the cowrie shell almost surely came over from Africa Mm -hmm. through trade, probably through the slave trade. Mm -hmm. The other objects we don't know, they may have been American, they may have been European, but somebody collected them together into this sort of packet, which has symbolic and spiritual significance. And if we look at the Nkisi from Africa, so I read some of this book that you lent me, Rituals of Resistance by Jason R. Young, which is on religious practices in America and their connections to Africa, specifically to Congo. And he, he makes this point that you can't just say that certain things or certain ideas just transplanted from Africa to America unchanged. There was always evolution and adaptation. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this precursor of Nkisi, the creation of Minkisi in Congo, it seems that it fit into the Congolese sort of cosmology, where they believe there's a spirit world, there are spiritual entities with great powers Mm -hmm. who abide in the spirit world but can also be summoned into the world of the living, the everyday world, to do things, whether good or bad, right? Mm -hmm. Protection, harm, the uncovering of secrets, healing, and so forth. And so people made objects that sort of served to connect to and summon these spirits. And like you said, they might be effigies, right? Sort of statues, figurines that the spirit can then inhabit act through, communicate through, or they could just be objects that in some way were understood to get the attention and sort of arouse the activity of these spiritual entities. So it seems even in Congo, there was a pattern where people would put together objects that had some special significance in summoning spirits and directing them and those might particularly include shiny objects things like shiny metal or glass or mirror which was understood to catch the attention of spirits Mm. so it makes sense right off the bat that a spirit bundle made in america that's drawing on the same sort of ideas would include broken glass that's like a Mm. classic thing you'd find in an inkisi or a spirit bundle Also, nails or pins Mm -hmm. is another one. Mm -hmm. It's understood as a way to kind of grab the attention, sort of arouse a spirit, right? And our modern day image of voodoo dolls maybe is kind of like a distortion of that, Mm -hmm. the the notion that, oh, you're maybe you're hurting someone, but certainly... I would would say they just have the same kind of maybe origin point. And they have kind Mm -hmm. of, when we're talking about how they develop, voodoo kind of comes from the more southern part. Uh, of what becomes North America. So this is more of something that's kind of from South Carolina North, thinking of these British colony only. 
Uh, whereas, you know, voodoo dolls and voodoo, I think, comes from similar aspects of African cosmology, West African cosmology, and moved into... Into the French. And developed into, yeah, yeah, in Spanish. Differently, right, in French and Spanish domains, yeah. And actually, it's interesting, Jason Young points out at one point how this basic idea of Nkisi sort of, like you said, branched out and took on different forms and came to be known by different names in different places... But in some places, they still, people remained aware that it came from a Congolese root. That connection to Congo continued. And so he, he points out at one point, in Cuba, enslaved Africans recast these objects as prenda, figures created by a ritual expert who filled a kettle or a pot with all manner of spiritualizing forces. In addition to the prenda, 19th century Cubans also created carved figurines used to attack enemies and slaveholders. In Haiti, ritual experts created Pake Congo by wrapping sacred medicines in silk, cotton, or raffia cloth. So in the in the Haitian case, they actually in it was still there in the name that this people still associated this with Congo. Right. So something something I think you find a lot, and we can maybe talk about this more later, is when you look at the records from the 18th century, early 19th century, people continued to be quite aware of the places in Africa mm -hmm. that African captives came from mm -hmm. and of their identities and their languages. Mm -hmm. Have you found that in your in your research? Uh, yeah, most definitely. Um, one interesting one I saw is I think one of the things that's come up already in my mind as we've been talking has been Rebecca Scott uh, and Jean Hebrard's uh, Freedom Papers. Are you familiar with that one? No. Um, so the, in it, they talk, they kind of follow, it's like a micro history in motion and they follow mm -hmm. a, a family, an African family through time um, and through multiple different nations. So uh, the French colonial empire, Spanish colonial empire, they go back into Europe, they end up in Belgium. Anyway, the, the, their origin uh, kind of comes from the last name Poulard, Mm -hmm. um, which they connect to a particular ethnic group in West Africa who had supposedly a predilection for understanding writing and using written sources, but maybe kind of channeling in this way we're thinking about this cosmology of, of power in an object, mm -hmm. um, con thinking of that about a written piece of paper or a document and how that can, can give you protection. And then how, how that kind of moved with the family in this understanding of how documents can provide protection and allowed them to maintain freedom throughout several centuries. Mm -hmm. um, and they, and these authors connect it to this earlier West African tradition of, of connecting power to uh, objects. Mm, okay. So you could understand the paper itself right. as like a powerful object. And they connected that through the last name Poulard, which... I, I believe is I, I'm an, I don't want to say the wrong one, but it's Pul I believe it's Pular or Fular. Maybe you know better mm. than I do. Um, this ethnic group that I mean they they connected it through. So. Okay, okay. So cool. I thought it was very interesting. There's also I saw more recently um, an enslaved African named Obo, which I think would probably be connected to Ebo. Um, you know, and mm. I think that it's it's throughout the record, and the more familiar you become with particular ethnic groups mm -hmm. and their mm -hmm. names, but then also the way those names were bastardized over time, then yeah, they these just really kind of come forward. Yeah, Alfred Niger, right, right, and, like the river yeah. in West Africa. Yep, yeah, and he's a prominent uh, black suffragist in early 1800s Rhode Island. Wow, and and I I've done a little research on New Netherlands, mm -hmm. and you find slaves who were owned by the Dutch West India Company mm -hmm. in New Netherlands who were mostly named after the places they came from. So th that's how they were called in the records, Anthony Congo, mm -hmm. Anthony Saint mm -hmm. you know, after the places in Africa or the Atlantic Islands they came from. Mm -hmm. And also, so that that's surnames. And then also with first names, mm -hmm. you if you see names like Kojo, mm -hmm. Cuff, Cuffy, mm -hmm. Cuba, mm -hmm. you know, these are, a lot of them are West African day names, mm -hmm. sort of customary names you would give to someone based on the day of the week they were born. Mm -hmm. And those are just everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me like they continue right through to the present. Oh, People yeah. continue to be named oh. Kojo. I mean, Paul Cuffey is, is a pretty prominent figure in, in yeah. uh, Southern New England history. And I live down the street from Paul Cuffey School. So In Providence. In Providence, yeah. yeah so that's yeah. right there. Yeah. So these threads are all there if you if you know to notice them, mm -hmm. right? 
Now, so let's talk about this particular spirit bundle and where it was found and what that might tell us. Mm -hmm. So, as I mentioned, it was found under the floorboards in the upstairs level mm -hmm. of the Wanton Lyman Hazard House. So to begin with, let's let's break that down one piece at a time. Well, can I? Yeah. So you so you say that it was found on the second floor in a in a closet. So I'm from, yes. you're from you've been in the Lyman Hazard House. You've been there. Yeah. I've, I've I've also been in there. So I'm familiar with the space. Mm -hmm. I was I was told that it was in the garret that it was found. Okay. What what's so so, so Garrett is, is like the attic floor, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And so yeah. not on that first floor in a in a closet. If it was on the first floor in a closet, I think that would have or on the second floor in the closet that would have a different meaning for me and how I would understand its placement. And it would maybe be not for protection, but if it would be up in the garret where I would presume the enslaved Africans to be living, That's a good point. that would be the space to be protected. That's a good point. You might be right that it was in the garret but that I was shown it and told about it on the second floor, and we didn't actually go all the way up to the garret. But it was under the floorboards in the garret is how I understood right. it. So okay. almost You're in probably the right. you ceiling must be right. of the second floor. Yeah, yeah. So, so, what, so in the garret, you would have this sort of cramped, truncated floor, which is the most common place where enslaved domestic servants would be placed in in kind of northern northern urban experience of right enslavement. right yeah. so space is at a premium you don't have separate slave quarters you put them in basically the same place you would put you know low low status domestic servants in an english house which is up in the garret or sometimes down in the in the cellar right, right? so this is a typical sort of place where people have found art and objects associated with african people in new england Right. So I don't know how much investigation has been done on this in Rhode Island, mm. but you sent me a very interesting article reporting on the investigations into living quarters and burial grounds in sort of southeastern Connecticut, mm -hmm. the sort of section of Connecticut close to Rhode Island, where you had a certain number of kind of wealthy rural landowners who tended to have slaves. And a very interesting point this article made is that you can find a lot of material remains related to enslaved African people because they tended to be enslaved by wealthy individuals with big houses and big properties that are more likely to be preserved and still be standing today. So you can find uh, cosmological diagrams, drawings, uh, apparently sort of amulet type objects in cellars, sometimes built into the walls or tucked into the floor. So the floorboards part makes a lot of sense, right? You put an object like this in a hidden place and particularly the floor seems to have been pretty common. So, so do, you, do you have, what, what would you say about that, about why, why it might be in a hidden place or particularly in the floor? Yeah, I, got, I, I mean, maybe that has something to do with kind of the location of the, the spirit world being underground. I'm not yeah. sure. I mean, I, one quick interlude I want to point out is, is the canine burial that is just mm. across the street. Uh, so there is a uh, a Quaker meeting house, which was built 1699. The house we're talking about, the Wanton Lyman Hazard House, was built 1697. Mm -hmm. It's the oldest house in Newport. But the Quaker meeting house was, was built on top of uh, about a 5,000-year-old site of indigenous significance. And in the 1970s, they were doing an excavation and or sorry, they were doing renovation. They pulled up the floorboards and they found some indigenous artifacts. So they conducted a kind of small archaeological survey. And one of the things they found there was a canine burial. Mm -hmm. And the canine burial was three dogs or, or two dogs and a puppy, a male dog, a female dog, and a, and a puppy. And they did a carbon dating of it and they did it to 1150 A.D., Okay. Those native people, kind of the and the ancestors of what we now know as the Narragansett Nation, um, would have buried that those dogs as a means to protect that space in the same way that dogs kind of protect humans in this way. Today, these dogs were buried in the same way to to uh, protect. So, uh, and dogs in this instance have a particular special place in between the spirit world and mm -hmm. this world because they're kind of they're domesticated animals. They come from nature, but they live with you know humankind yeah. and they're guardians right, right. there right. you would have dogs guarding a camp or a village mm -hmm. so it makes sense if you have a, a 
a specific place that is sacred or important socially, you would have a dog kind of spiritually protecting it. And it's really interesting if you look at colonial houses, English colonial houses in Boston, mm. many of them had cats buried under the threshold. Interesting. And I don't know if anyone has really figured out the exact evolution of that practice whether it carried over from england or was invented in massachusetts mm. but that's a very common thing and cats also are guardians they guard right. the grain the food right. against right. mice so you would bury them put them under your threshold so this is not in other words the basic idea of of burying an important object for protection mm -hmm. in your living space is not only an African thing. It takes on different forms and varieties mm -hmm. all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, but this one particularly was put under the floorboards. And like, like you said, it probably has something to do with communicating downwards, right? Summoning spirits that live in kind of in an underworld realm. And, and actually, Congolese people apparently described it as underwater. Mm -hmm. There's sort of the world of the living, mm -hmm. then there's a realm of water, and then the spirit world below that and so these shiny objects like glass or mirror would help to summon the spirits up through those realms of the cosmos into the world of the living and some of those houses in connecticut have kettles or pots with similar objects buried under the cornerstone or under the threshold mm -hmm. so same basic idea mm -hmm. and this one was in the wanton lyman hazard house so what what is significant about the wanton lyman hazard house well as it's yeah, called yeah it's like i said before it was uh, built in 1697 so it's the oldest standing house that still exists uh in the city of newport um and it's kind of had a long cast of characters that kind of led mm -hmm. to well to be fair it's six that brought it to 1911 <laughs> so really not that long a cast of characters it's built in 1697 by a guy named stephen mumford um, who was a Seventh-day Baptist. Mumford ended up selling it to Richard Ward, who famously went on to become governor, 1741. <laughs> um, followed by one of... And then uh, Ward, whose son would also, I believe, go on to become governor. So that house raised at least two governors, right? Because he lived there before he was governor. Great anyway, record. sorry. And yeah, right, exactly. Um, and then after that, Richard Ward sold it to a gentleman by the name of Martin Howard. Martin Howard Jr. Uh, who I believe you have a particular affinity for. Uh, yes. Maybe we can return to why. But then we have uh, John Wanton, um, who per purchased it at auction um, after Martin, Martin Howard, Howard was fled the yes, colony. Yes, <laughs> ran, was run out of the colony uh, in 1765 during the Stamp Act riots. Right? Daniel Lyman bought it. Uh, sorry, Daniel Lyman married a daughter of John Wanton, who purchased it from auction. And Benjamin Hazard married a daughter of Daniel Lyman. And the Hazard family kept it until 1911 when the Newport Historical Society purchased it and they own it to this mm -hmm. day mm -hmm. and are the caretakers of the space. And I imagine um, when we are not in a global pandemic, they will return to doing and offering tours of the space right. and right. providing living history reenactments from the space as well. So there's a lot to unpack there. It's like you said, it's the oldest house still standing in Newport. And if you go look at it today, it looks like a pretty nice, large old house. It's sort of painted in like trolley red, you know, three three stories, pretty large window bays, but it's nothing amazing. It doesn't, it's not as impressive as some Georgian houses no. from a bit later. No, and no. it certainly doesn't compare to the crazy Victorian uh, mansions no. down by the seashore, but it was pretty impressive for the time when mm. it was built. Right, mm -hmm. that early Newport is still a pretty small, minor colonial governor, port. You know, the ho house of a governor. You know, yeah, yeah. So for that time, it was a pretty serious upper class home. Mm -hmm. So it makes a lot of sense that these wealthy, prominent people in Newport would have had enslaved right. laborers in the house. Right. There's nothing that completely fits into the pattern, mm -hmm. and it's pretty amazing. You know, I was aware of it partly because of the famous incident where Martin Howard Jr., who was a sort of young, ambitious lawyer who obtained the house in the 1760s, he advocated during the, the controversies over the Sugar Act and the Stamp Act, he advocated for the Crown to revoke Rhode Island's charter and make Rhode Island into a royal colony, which was very unpopular. They, Rhode Islanders love their charter. Oh, they're, they're super enthusiastic about that charter. 
And it was a very self-governing colony. I mean, mm-hmm. with almost no interference by Britain at that point. So yeah. he becomes... Don't you forget it. Yeah. So he becomes sort of an arch-Tory, you know, public enemy number one. And during the height of the, of the crisis, August 1765, mobs go around Newport ransacking the homes of people who supported the Stamp Act and who were suspected of possibly wanting to become stamp masters themselves. Well, he wasn't. He was... He wasn't the stamp master. Well, I don't think any official appointment was ever oh, made. Okay. I, he was if I remember very, right, very like clearly going to be at he the was, front of the line. He was gunning for it. Yeah, he was yeah. gunning for it. And he was in good, much better than anyone else in Newport. So he's sort of the prime target. And mobs go in and and ransack the house, and they burn furniture, tear up the family portraits. They just go wild, break all the glassware. And he then fled the town, right? He couldn't remain in Newport. So it seems like whatever was in there was wrecked. Right. That's right? actually a great point because, yeah. right, we're talking about the, one, the oldest house in Newport. Mm-hmm. We're trying to determine when this Nkisi was, was, was you know, hidden. Mm-hmm. And it could be at any point in time these people from 1697 is actually the first year of the instance of, of – uh, enslaved Africans in Rhode Island mm. Um, mm. on a ship called Beginning, I believe, which is an interesting... <laughs> a little uh, too fitting. <laughs> yeah, uh, but, you know, Mumford, Ward, or Howard, any of them could have had enslaved Africans, mm-hmm. especially, you know, thinking of Martin and, uh, Ward and, and, and Howard as, you know, elite. But, yeah, then, then if they burned everything and stole a bunch of things from the house, it's probably pretty unlikely that something like this would have survived even. Well, but if it was under the floorboards in the garret. But if they were setting some fires, I don't know. I'm just thinking now I'm thinking, okay, maybe this is, maybe it, we have to start thinking of it only wanton on because of the Stamp Act riot within the home, just as a, well, I don't know. I think, me think about. I think of it more like it's an irony that this might be the only surviving object from the house from before that point. Yep. Everything else yep. was wrecked, but this, because it was hidden, because it was in a sort of out of the way place, yep. it might be the one thing that actually remained to then be found. Fascinating. 200 plus years later. And also, we don't know, I think one of the things we also need to recognize is we know the things that were were there in the bundle, bundle, but we don't know what wasn't there, what has decayed um, over time and didn't last the last 300 years. You know, something like hair. Yeah. If hair was present, it's not going to last. Any sort of, like, animal mm-hmm. hide, something like that that might have been used or or even, like... Yeah, I don't know, pieces of paper could have fully rotted away from now. Now, so I mean, there's so many possibilities, and we also don't know... When it was found, the people who found it almost surely didn't know what it was and didn't know whether or not they should keep it intact or what to do with it. So we can't know for certain that everything in it was preserved. And you mentioned hair. It seems that it was a common custom to put a certain combination of objects into a bundle one to sort of summon and catch the attention of a spirit like we said like shiny objects something to inform it what ought to be done so whether it was love or healing or revenge whatever it was that the person was trying to get and then a third object to direct the spirit towards a target and so that often included hair or clothing or something from the person that you were aiming the spirit at someone that you wanted to persuade to tell the truth or someone you wanted to heal or someone you wanted to seduce, whatever it was. So it would make sense that there there might have been something more personal from a particular person or even from a person's body, but we just don't see it right now in the bundle as it survives nope. today. Unfortunately. Right. <laughs> but who knows? Maybe maybe whoever found it was completely meticulous and faithful about it. We just uh we just don't have the information in front of us right now. Right. But let's say then, okay, so it seems very likely there was an enslaved person, very likely African born, living in the garret of the Wanton Lyman Hazard House in the eighteenth century, who put this object here. What could we say about who this person might have been or how they ended up here? Who were the African people in, say, beginning just with Newport? Who were the sort of African people in Newport in the 18th century? 
Well, one of the first, one of the things that I want to kind of get out of the gate uh, to kind of push push back on kind of common misconceptions is the idea of the the triangle trade as the sole manner through which enslaved Africans came to somewhere like Rhode Island. So right, the general idea is they come from, enslaved Africans come from somewhere in West Africa, maybe Ghana kind of particularly, and it was now Ghana in this particular point in time, Cape Coast, Cape Coast Castle. Mm-hmm. Maybe they come from there uh, to Barbados, somewhere in Jamaica, somewhere in a British, co- uh, British colony in the Caribbean, and then they go from there um, back up to somewhere in New England. But that the idea, I think, is that a, a good portion of, or if not all, of the uh, enslaved Africans in Rhode Island came by way of the Caribbean. While I think that that's true for the majority of them, I don't think it's the vast majority. And I think that there are some great resources um, available to now, you know, in the 21st century, to be able to keep track of the, the these ships that were enslaving Africans, um, particularly the British ships. Um, one is slavevoyages.org, which is a great mm. website, has an incredible database, and could not be as precise as it is without the work of Jay Cowtree, a book called The Notorious Triangle, um, which has an index where he details basically every single voyage that he could find in the Colonia- in the uh, National Archive in London. London. Um, and so you can go on Slave Voyages now, and everything is really well cited, so I feel really confident about kind of the research that I pull from it. And one of the things you find is that between 1740 and 1760, there is actually about 5,000 or more Africans directly imported um, from the western coast of Africa, not going to the Caribbean, and going directly to Rhode Island specifically. A lot of different scholars, historians write about how Newport specifically is the center of the New England slave slave trade at large. Um, and so from that port would be where, you know, these, these enslaved Africans are kind of distributed throughout southern New England, maybe even to New York or, or farther south. So that's one of the first things I want to kind of get out of the table is that there is certainly... Uh, on record in this time period, you know, thinking about 1740 to 1760 as this time period before the Stamp Act riot, which is in 1765, as a moment in time where there is an increased African-born population coming directly from the coast, not spending any time in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. That would make something like this even more likely. Mm -hmm. Um, And the ability to carry a cowrie shell from West Coast Africa Mm -hmm. becomes easier to do if you skip by way of you know, a slave market in Barbados. Yeah, yeah. And as as Jason Young points out, there were people who were understood to be sort of specialists in spiritual matters in among the enslaved African population. And he focuses on South Carolina, but also considers all kinds of other places. And some of them were said to have brought their most important kind of sacred objects and most powerful objects with them on their persons through the middle passage to America. So it, it it's if this person who created the the bundle in the Wanton Lyman Hazard House had this cowrie shell, it's very likely it came from Africa and the person who put it there may have been one of these important, you know, s- specialist knowledgeable people in magic, in spirituality. And maybe the per- maybe that was the person who was living in the house, mm-hmm. or maybe it was someone else that they consulted with. They might have gone to someone else who was had a who collection had a rep- of cowrie shells. Yeah, you know? yeah, and who had a reputation, you know. And there are different words, different people use, like conjure, mm-hmm. conjure woman, or conjure man, mm-hmm. uh, who who had this sort of special knowledge and expertise, and you could consult with them for all of these matters: healing, love, prosperity. So. You mentioned the number 5,000, right? If you had walked around in Newport in, say, 1750, there wouldn't have been 5,000 African people, right? They would have been, a lot of them probably died pretty quickly. You know, it was much, it was worse that way in the Caribbean. Most people died within six years, right, of being brought over on the Middle Passage. But a lot of people would have died in the new environment in New England. Many would have been sold off to different places, different plantations different colonies and particularly newport supplied the sort of area just west of the town Mm -hmm. what was sometimes called the narragansett country Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which developed into kind of a slave labor based plantation society in the 18th century 
they had kind of their own uh, you know it wasn't again like you're saying it wasn't just oh we dumped them all off in Barbados a lot of them were being brought and put into forced labor right in New England yeah I think uh, I, I might be wrong but I think in 1730 uh, they did a census and and in Rhode Island and South Kingston, kind of the region you're speaking about specifically, mm-hmm. was 30 percent black in 1730. So it was probably a small population in general, you know, overall. But yeah. of that population, a 30 percent of them uh, were black, yeah. and we can probably make a safe assumption that a majority of those people were enslaved Africans. Meanwhile, mm-hmm. in Newport, which is like you know around 1774, the, the largest city in Rhode Island. It's about 9,000 people, and about Mm -hmm. 3,000 of them are enslaved Africans. Does that sound to you? I think that's right. It might be. Yeah. 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 (laughs) I I know that 48 of them on the census are are Indian, so I think that uh, that's the number I got. But um, Yeah, there's this remarkable 1774 census when the colony is kind of getting ready to possibly go to war, Mm -hmm. right, with with the mother country. Mm Mm-hmm. And they do this, this like very bizarre census, really, where they go through all the households Mm -hmm. and they list the number, they list people by color, Mm -hmm. not by status of free or enslaved. Mm -mm. And they list for each household, how many adult men, boys, adult, white adult women, Mm -hmm. girls, Mm -hmm. and then blacks and Mm -hmm. Indians. And they, they, they have, they have, um, gender and age for blacks and, and Indians as well. They do? Really? Yeah, I guess yeah. I've only seen the, the rough course. tabulation. Well, yes, you're probably familiar with the John Bartlett <laughs> yes, 1856 the... <laughs> edition. For the masses. <laughs> uh, that he compiled. But the original source, uh, you know, John okay. Bartlett writing in 1850s didn't really think that, that the African and Indian information was important. Was so worth. So compile it into the, the text we still use often, most often today to look at that census. Uh, but the original source... Mm. The manuscript has the has yeah has that information on there, which is fascinating. And one of the also things fascinating things for me about that census is that you can actually, by pairing up the homes and where we know the homes are, we can you can almost follow the the path of the sense of the of the colonial town official, you know, the census taker. Right, as he went through the streets, yeah, yeah. And, and find where these homes are, where these neighborhoods are that have, maybe for example, free Africans um, living in conjunction with one another. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I think we're, we're really kind of focusing, I think very, very specifically on this, like earlier 1730, 1740s, 1750s period, um, about with Africans in Newport. But I also think that when we get to the late 18th century, we have uh, a really, really fascinating kind of story in the, the free African union society, which is a, mm-hmm. essentially a conglomerate of free Africans who work to help manumit enslaved Africans. It's kind of mm-hmm. one of the first... Um, mutual aid societies formed in what becomes North um, United States, um, and as far as my research goes, it's one of, the, if not the first instance, uh, again in what becomes the United States, where the term African is used by Africans as a means to kind of conglomerate um, a variety of ethnic groups under a single term. Right, right. And was was that 1780? I think when it was first formed. Yeah. Yes, at the yeah. same time that the French were also occupying the island, which I think is an important um, yeah. thing to note. Yeah, well, New- Newport has a very bizarre, tumultuous history with all kinds of forces coming and going. It was occupied by the British for three years. Then after they withdraw, the French are quartered there uh, at the last stages of the revolution. And so this Free African Union Society forms in 1780. And then also African, very early African-American churches mm-hmm. are formed, mm-hmm. late 18th, early 19th centuries. Newport for a time is kind of like a, a mecca, you could say, of African American mm-hmm. life, mm-hmm. along with Philadelphia. I right. think there was another African, free yeah. African society Correct. in Philadelphia. They were in communication with each other. Mm-hmm. So there's this sort of efflorescence, which we don't think about much today, just like we don't think much about slavery in New England. Mm-hmm. It's kind of dropped out of our historical picture, but it's really big. Mm-hmm. And there were some famous, you could say, kind of uh, people oh. of African descent oh, yeah. in Newport. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think, you know, we've talked about Okramar Mariku. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or is it Okramar? O- o- Okramar Mariku, yeah, yeah. Mariku, Newport yeah. Gardner. Also called Newport Gardner, yeah. who was African-born, mm-hmm. 
learned English and French yeah. as well. And right? spoke his mother tongue, obviously. Yeah. As well as right his native language, right. and he became a very accomplished musician and music teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, really, a, a pretty prominent resident of Newport, mm -hmm. uh, who had kind of made this whole journey, and he was one of a number of free people oh, yeah. who started organizing and particularly with a view towards the goal of moving free African people back to Africa. Well, that was, that was, yeah, Newport Gardner particular, his, his thing. Not all, I wouldn't say that that was kind of, I think there was probably a debate within the Free African Union Society Definitely. about whether or not that was the, the way to move, move forward. Um, I think that there were members of the society that felt like they had built Mm -hmm. what was here um, in the North American British colonies and that they didn't need to go back to Africa when this was the place that they and their ancestors had built. Um, but Newport Gardner also was in, uh, re in regular conversation with um, a Congregationalist pastor, um, Hopkins, Samuel, Samuel Hopkins. Hopkins. Samuel yeah. Hopkins. I get him always confused. I can't remember. Is it Stephen Hopkins? Samuel Hopkins. <laughs> yeah. it's Samuel Hopkins. Samuel Hopkins. In, and Samuel Hopkins is often in the ear of Newport Gardner conveying how important it would be if all of the blacks were back, went back to Africa. Wouldn't that be fabulous? Wouldn't yeah. that be fabulous? And I think Newport Gardner kind of took it a little bit more to heart. But the funny, the interesting story about Newport Gardner is that he uh, gained his freedom by winning a lottery. The perfect Rhode Island way <laughs> <laughs> to gain your freedom. He, a and lottery. he, I guess, maybe from doing his music lessons, was able to gather a little mm. bit of money to enter into the lottery. And um, and yeah, and then he won the lottery. And this was seemingly a, 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 a regular way for people to win their freedom is to win money through the lottery and then pay for their manumission. Another instance is a guy named John Quamino and Bristol Yama, who went on to become the first two black students at Princeton. Um, John mm. Quamino's wife is known as Duchess Quamino, um, and she uh, lived in the house of William Ellery Channing. Similarly, went on to purchase her freedom, but this her own freedom. Uh, but instead of the lottery or music lessons, she sold pies, um, and was able to to in her spare time sell enough pies to buy her freedom and the freedom of her family. Pies to freedom. Mm -hmm. This fits into a sort of bigger picture where enslavement, enslaved labor worked quite differently in New England or in the North more generally than what we tend to think of yeah. in the plantation South, right. right? There's a lot of close interaction. It tends to be more in towns and cities, mm -hmm. although in some places like the Narragansett country, it was on rural plantations too, but it tends I, to be- I think that's probably the that's like the only instance where that's happening, but it does kind of throw a wrench in the in the gears of this kind of narrative that mm -hmm. plantations only existed in the South. In the so South, yeah. we can very much say and talk about plantations here in Rhode Island, or we're in Massachusetts, over there in Rhode Island. <laughs> Nearby. Nearby Rhode in Rhode Island. Island. Uh, and I know I think that came up a lot with the, the Providence Plantations debate that just came up um, with mm -hmm. the state. But mm -hmm. sorry, I didn't mean yeah, to cut you yeah. off there. Oh, yeah, we that's a whole other kettle of fish but uh but you have a lot of enslaved people in the north who are african born a lot of them have very valuable skills they have skills in small industry they have skills in domestic work like you said cooking also healing uh, and more of them more often become free more so than in the south especially as time goes on mm -hmm. So by the time you get to the end of the 18th century, there are really more free people of color in these towns than there are people still enslaved. And it's not surprising that the states phase it out around 1800, you know, give or take a couple decades, uh, whereas it persists in the South, where it's just a much bigger part of the productive economy. Um, but that's not to say that slavery wasn't just as brutal, right, and that there wasn't just as much struggle uh, in these northern towns as there was on southern plantations, right? And I think you've just recently been looking at how people might have resisted or undermined the slave system. Yeah, I'm actually uh, I'm in the process of working on a project with the uh, Rhode Island Historical Society about the, the history of protest in Rhode Island and... I had come up across something uh, in a footnote of a footnote uh, about a, a, 
what seemed to be what I determined to be a slave revolt in Newport in 1747. It being COVID, global pandemic, I was kind of thinking I wasn't going to be able to, you know, or, or no, that I, I thought that because of COVID, I would be able to reach out to the particular archive where this information was and that they would maybe be more willing to take a photograph of it and send it to me, which they did. And uh, it was about, you know, 12 page manuscript. And, and it was, as I went through it, it details um, the trial of a, a gentleman named Cambridge Taylor, uh, who was enslaved African from a man of a man named Peter Taylor, um, who's who's maybe a butcher. It's kind of unclear who the butcher is. I wouldn't be surprised if Cambridge Taylor was also the butcher. Mm-hmm. It would make him a really interesting character to start a slave revolt if he is a butcher. <laughs> if he's literally a butcher. If he's a butcher. <laughs> um, but the testimony, uh, which is given by a woman named uh, an, an indigenous woman named Sarah, um, she testifies and says that she overheard Cambridge in a tavern talking about the best way. To start, a, to start an uprising would be for every enslaved person to slit the throat of their master. And so that was that was the extent of it. That's what I thought the extent of it was. That's what the footnote I had read said the extent of it was. But then I got the original document and I read a little bit more, transcribed the lithography because it was a little bit difficult to read out of the gate. And what it seems to say is that Cambridge Taylor with arms two times tried to take a dwelling house. Um, it does not seem to be like he was alone when he was doing this. Uh, and it was the dwelling house of a, a, a gentleman who has a wonderful name, Genderford Lindy. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's kind of gone through many different changes over time. It's I believe spelled every possible. Yeah. Way. I believe the J might actually be an S and it's Sandiford Lindy, but other people have transcribed it as Genderford. So we're sticking with Genderford for now. Um, but anyway, Thinking in 1747 and um, kind of a larger, a larger Atlantic and the African Atlantic or Black Atlantic um, at this point in time, um, you can look at, first of all, a really great book that just came out um, by Vincent Brown. It's called Tacky's Revolt. Uh, it talks about Tacky's Revolt in Jamaica, in Jamaica, which I believe is 1750. I think it was 60. 1760? Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah, yeah 1760. Um, but then in thinking of this also in conjunction with Jill Lepore's book, uh, which talks about New York burning, which is about mm-hmm. a slave revolt uh, in 1741 in New York. Mm-hmm. So what's great about Vincent Brown's Tacky's Revolt is that he he says that we need to think about slave revolt as as a part of an African diaspora of war, and that we need to think of in the same way that we're thinking of these people as as healers or or um, you know having pre existing skill sets that they bring with them from Africa westward. Obviously, that's going to be inclusive of soldiers and generals and commanders. And so we need to think of slave revolts, particularly like there was another one that happened in 1730 in Antigua. And then another, the southern 1741. And then we can kind of, if we want to kind of think of this diaspora, then we can probably include 1747, this Newport slave revolt of Cambridge Taylor, um, kind of thinking in conjunction with all of this. So, you know, yeah, we often have this story and tell this story of, of of North, the North American or North Northern United States, Black experience of an enslaved person, and it's it's so varied um, from what it was experienced in the South. Um, but there are also these commonalities. Something like the the idea that no matter what, you know, there that there would be someone trying to you know revolt or push back. Yeah. Um, and change the situation that they are in, not just for themselves, but for those around them. Yeah, and I think a big point that scholars are making now more and more is that all of these communities were aware of each other, both the different groups within a town like Newport and also these people of African descent in New England, in Philadelphia, in the Southern colonies, in the Caribbean, even and back in Europe, in Britain, mm-hmm. they were all aware mm-hmm. that the news, the rumors mm-hmm. were traveling back and forth, yeah. and one thing could spill over into another into another, which is part of why the slave owning class was so paranoid. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if one thing got out of control, maybe like, say, the Stono Rebellion, 
in South Carolina or later the Haitian Revolution in Haiti. Mm -hmm. There was no telling what else it might trigger anywhere, really anywhere in the world. It was kind of uncontainable. And it's interesting, like you mentioned, well, there's this footnote to, referring to a legal record where an enslaved woman said, we should start by cutting our master's throats. And as a historian, that's the sort of thing that you can light on and say, wait a second, is that just a little offhand remark of someone saying, I'm sick of these white people, we should right. cut their throats? Right. Or is this, or is there another story going on here? Was there something more serious behind this? Mm -hmm. And that sort of process of trying to uncover that can actually like echo what these magistrates were doing mm. back then mm. of like, uh, this this enslaved woman just said this. Should we be worried about this? Is it? Or do we need to like put this whole colony on high alert that right. they're about to revolt and attack? Right. And there's this kind of constant paranoia. And when northern colonies and northern states abolished slavery or prohibited slavery from beginning in the first place, sometimes it was just out of this sort of fear of like, we can't handle this we don't want to create an angry population that might turn against us mm -hmm. at any moment. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't always just about the, the morality of it, though, you know, that was a factor, too, for a lot of people, that it was unjust or unchristian. Mm -hmm. But it was also just constant fear, right? Yeah. <laughs> constant fear of the enslaved people around you. And you mentioned this word, I think, sort of lastly, to kind of talk about the theoretical complications of this all and like mm. what do we make of mm. all these clues and all these signs and connections you mentioned this word diaspora yeah. and it seems scholars have kind of there's been a lot of debate and a lot of confusion a lot of evolution in how you think about african people in all these different places and how did they relate to each other and how do you understand what they were doing and why? And why they would do something like create a spirit bundle, right? And was it just a personal thing? Was it political? Was it a form of resistance? Did it have to do with identity? And basically, it seems if you go back to scholarship in about the 1940s, right? The common consensus was nothing carried over. Mm -hmm. Right. right. And right. and and you still kind of hear this point of view sometimes. Occasionally it's still kind of put forward as like correct orthodox opinion that uh, the 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 middle passage in the slave trade just like destroyed culture. So no culture came over from Africa to America and Afro-Americans were like kind of a blank slate that had to improvise and make everything up from from the ground up and in a way you can see like there's maybe some logic to that right if you say well the african people were not uniform they were coming from different societies with different languages and different religions and if you just kind of throw them together into this crazy mixing bowl in a place like newport or charleston they're not just going to do african stuff right they're going to have to come up with something else so you can see some logic there, right? But then on the other hand, there are also things that make you stop and say, no, clearly something did come over, right? And, you know, you can see this this in Kesey in this house in Newport as one little instance of that, but there are many others, right? Linguistically, mm -hmm. religious practices. There, I mean, there's a great, uh, we talked about the Stone and Rebellion, there's a great book by a guy named Peter Wood, uh, which is called Black Majority, and it talks mm -hmm. about um, rise of culture, rice culture mm -hmm. in South Carolina. Um, Judith Carney's book, Black Rice, builds on this much later. Um, but the idea is, you know, yeah, we always kind of think about agriculture, but but also rice comes, in addition to agriculture, comes with this entire system of how it needs to be um, propagated. Um, it's, it's much more complicated than simply throwing some seeds in the ground and hoping for rain. And those skills and those skill sets, again, directly directly came across from particular cultures in West Africa. Um, and at per certain points, South Carolina planters were specifically looking for those ethnic groups because they knew that they would have the particular knowledge of rice, rice culture um, to be used in South Carolina. And it was that particular um, rice economy that allowed South Carolina to 
eventually emerge as yeah. as a very powerful colony uh, of the 13. Yeah, yeah. And this this debate over what's sometimes called the Black Rice thesis yeah. in Judith Carney's book, which you mentioned is called Black Rice. Right. It's been like one of the big flashpoints, I think, in this kind of bigger, broader debate about African life or Africanisms in America. But it's this huge instance where, as we said, slaves who came over were not just these like raw material laborers. They had knowledge and they had skills as they came over and different enslavers used that in different ways or negotiated with it in different ways. And one of them is in the South Carolina low country, you have this terrain that's good for wet rice cultivation, but that's a very complex technology. And what do you know? It just so happens that that's what people were doing in the Senegambia region in West Africa. And some of these enslaved people being brought to America were from that area and knew that technology and made it possible. I mean, the, the over time, scholars have built up the evidence, the materials, the, the objects, the genetic evidence, the circumstantial evidence that I think demonstrates very clearly that it was transplanted from Africa by Africans to South Carolina and Georgia. There are still some who are not persuaded <laughs> yeah yeah and i think that kind of to get back to that you were talking about kind of the 1940s moment and the historiography and, and i think that if that perspective of that time period really perpetuates this kind of like all-powerful paternalism mm-hmm. that was basically non-existent you yeah. know that that also perpetuates notions of white supremacy and misogyny and all of this helps to push back on that and, and all of the things that we've been talking about today, I think push back on this idea that culture isn't resistance. Like mm-hmm. if anything, it is, especially in the instances that we're talking about, um, rise of culture, religious practices, like war, di- the diaspora of war. Yeah. And, and, and Jason Young, definitely, you know, his book is called rituals of resistance and he's making this definite argument that, doing things like creating a, a conjure bag or a spirit bundle was a way of kind of doing an end run around the whole ideology and the whole social structure of a slave plantation where you know all knowledge, all truth, and all decisions emanate down from the masters, right? Where you know enslaved people are not supposed to have their own ideas, their own goals, take action on their own behalf. And he makes this case that there were many instances where even uh, slaveholders were very wary and even afraid of these conjure women and conjure men and the things that they knew, the things they could do, and really had to kind of try to work with them to keep them in the structure of society rather than disrupting it or overthrowing it. And like again, there was very widespread fear <laughs> of the, the actions and the power of enslaved people or of free African people as well. But he also explains, I thought it was very interesting, he explains that the conceptually the situation is not so simple as just saying, no, things did carry over. Because kind of from uh, Melville Hershkovitz, And uh, Peter Wood, like you mentioned, who wrote Black Majority. In that generation, there was kind of this lurch in the other direction and this quest to kind of find what they called Africanisms, things that could be clearly matched up to some corresponding prototype in Africa. And they often spoke about, maybe not Wood himself specifically, but many scholars spoke about an African diaspora, this sort of model that there's like an original homeland, and that's where all the roots come from. And then those get transplanted out to various other places, and if you find those surviving African elements in some other place, in Connecticut or in Cuba, then you've shown, look, this African thing made it across. But if it's different, if it's if the name has been changed or the the contours of it have changed in some way, like it's no longer a statuette like in Nkisi you might find in Congo. Instead, it's a cloth bundle. 
there the critics will say oh so you see it's not it's not a real africanism it didn't really carry over it doesn't count and so contemporary scholars are sort of trying to reframe things a bit and say no all these places were all in communication with each other and the influence was traveling back and forth in all different directions and people didn't just automatically recreate exactly what they had been taught they adapted it and there's a sort of dynamic tradition and you don't have to worry so much about whether this is an authentic Africanism right that's just like you know if you find if you find a colonial practice that looks similar to something in France you're not going to sit there saying is this authentically French yeah that's, I mean that's how I'm thinking of this a good way I mean to kind of flip this I was thinking of American English I was like oh well mm -hmm. Does that even, should we even call it English anymore? Like, because we've changed so much, we speak so different. Like, and America's a melting pot, right. so it doesn't even count any as European anymore. Well, like, yeah. you know, they, people are dynamic, <laughs> they're always adapting and reinventing. Yeah. And some of those things could also then travel back to Africa. It's not like Africa was unaffected mm -hmm. by contact with America. And there were people, like we mentioned, there were some people who went back. You know, there were mm -hmm. people of African-American descent in Liberia and Sierra Leone and so on. So you can sort of see it as uh, w w what what Jason Young calls the, the African Atlantic, this mm -hmm. kind of bigger right. pool or, you know, uh, arena of exchange right. and change, not just this simple diaspora from the like authentic origin point out to those other places right. right it's kind of like one way acculturation happening like so yeah and i think that it, you did a great job i think of kind of, of flipping it on its head and saying well we wouldn't do this with say french or, or english you know i think that that's mm. really demonstrates the way in which non-anglo people i think in this instance are held to a particular um you know standard that that maybe the English were not, or white people in this instance were not. Um, like there is no like, st like there is no static African experience. Like mm -hmm. all things are the Africans are also East Africans are going to be influenced by like West Asians and mm -hmm. and Eastern Europeans, you know. And then that's going to come in and influence West Africa. All of these ships that are coming in and out of Africa are going to be influencing everyone. It's not like culture exists in some sort of vacuum, and that it's like some perfect hermetically it, yeah sealed. it's yeah. incredible that this is like has persisted for so long within the historiography but i mean you know racism but i think that the one of this is what is also interesting is that the same kind of mentality persists when talking about indigenous people and that like this kind of perception that indigenous people can't be modern and then the moment they say for example pick mm. up a gun or wear a suit <laughs> they're no longer indigenous they're not uh, the noble savage anymore. right right and they're no longer <laughs> authentically yeah. indigenous um but thinking about culture specifically in kind of this african diaspora um or the african atlantic as you as you said that uh, young calls it um you know i think really one of the really exciting parts about the Black Atlantic it are the black sailors of the Black Atlantic. Mm. Um, and the sea was a place, or the open ocean was a place for, for black men to actually, through wage labor on ships, actually gain freedom and, and serve for long instances um, and be out at sea, but also keep land and, um, you know, wife and child at home. Um, but it's because of those black sailors that a lot of, of, of information was passed through this, this, this Atlantic. And, you know, very specifically, it says we wouldn't, we really wouldn't have known as much as we do about the Haitian rebellion if it wasn't for the black sailors, you know, sailing to the, the, the ports, the various ports to explain what had happened. Mm. Um, and I don't know how, how, how direct of a line that we can draw to this comparison I'm about to make, but I just recently saw Angela Davis speak and she was talking about, someone had asked her a question about like black cops. And she was like, you know, like, what do you, how do you feel about, you know, black men participating? And because in this instance, it's like about, you know, there are, there are definitely African black sailors participating in the slave trade, not like some vast amount, but they were there. They were not absent from slave ships. Um, whether they were a cook, whether they were a sailor, whether they were enslaved themselves to do things for that ship. Um, but she says, if it wasn't for black cops, we would have never known that Fred Hampton, the Black Panther, was assassinated in his sleep in Chicago. 
Mm. You know, it was by by the Chicago Police Department. It was the black police officers there who saw that happening and said, I need to share this with my community. And that's the only reason why we know that information. So it's kind of thinking yeah. backwards in time, thinking about the Haitian Revolution, but also thinking of the power of kind of transmitting this information, you know, secreted, kind of returning yeah. to this idea of the, the, the secreted or hidden in Kisi. Um, I think is powerful and it's really powerful to to demonstrate or to think about this 18th century Atlantic, you know, Black Atlantic, African Atlantic, as you were calling it. Yeah, yeah. And, and maritime knowledge, too, is like, it's similar, like, to healing and medicinal knowledge. It's very complex and very specialized. Mm-hmm. And it's always had this enormous sphere of, of African knowledge in it and African American. And people often don't realize, you know, at times when the U.S. Army was segregated, the the Navy and the Merchant Marine were yeah. multiracial yeah. right through the, the Revolution, the Civil War, and right up until Woodrow Wilson, mm-hmm. the you know famous white supremacist president, decided to segregate Our only it. historian president, me too. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's... Way to go. <laughs> Way to go, Princeton. Yeah, but there's this very <laughs> deep history. Who, was it? Who was it? Who wrote Black Tars? I can't remember. I'll have to look uh, that up. Was it Marcus Redeker? Is that who you're thinking? Of? I'm thinking of. I don't. Think that's it who was I'm. Marcus Redeker. That's who I'm thinking of. Is Marcus Redeker? He wrote Black Sailors of the Atlantic. Something okay. similar. He also okay. is kind of this fantastic maritime scholar. Just in general, he writes yeah, consistently yeah. about is, the Atlantic. He is the but, great maritime scholar. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, yeah, Black Tar, Black Jacks. That that's must the, be a Black Jack. That's the yeah. name of the book I'm talking about. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's there's all of these kind of overlapping and interconnecting networks of African, European, indigenous, maritime, scientific, spiritual, religious. And whenever you find a person who's caught up in these networks, it's always very unpredictable. You don't, it's not simple, you know, where do their loyalties lie? And how are they making, you know, if you encounter even someone like Newport Gardner, where are his loyalties? What are what are his visions? And how, you know what is his identity? As we would say today, they're all more complicated than they seem, right? And more complicated than we would tend to think. Kind of projecting our categories back on them from from today. So, is there anything else you wanna you wanna add? Um, I mean, I just, I, I, I think that, yeah, we're kind of thinking, right, just, I guess, in closing, with, you know, that diversity of that experience, and you have someone like Newport Gardner, who, you know, is, is striving for his freedom, and then you have someone like um, Cesar Linden, you're familiar mm. with Cesar Linden, who, who keeps a diary, he's the oh, enslaved, yeah, like, yeah. secretary, essentially, of right. the, the governor, Josiah Linden, I believe is, yeah. is, and it may be one of the only diaries ever kept so an 18th century African man. Um, and this, his, his diary details, for example, um, Cesar London going on a picnic in yeah. Portsmouth from Newport, taking his governor, taking the governor's carriage mm-hmm. and riding to Portsmouth for a picnic with a group of free and enslaved Africans, African Americans yeah. that would then go and have a picnic in, in Portsmouth. Um, so, you know, like that is, that is certainly a different experience than, than one of someone like Newport Gardner, um, who wins his freedom in a lottery and then, you know, writes one of the first, if not the first song written by an African in what becomes the United States in the song Crooked Shanks. So, so his experience, again, it flies in the face of maybe the stereotype image we have of enslaved life on a plantation. For one thing, the fact that he was literate, and which is an important skill, he was a very skilled person, yeah. and literacy became illegal for enslaved people in the South, but there was no such law in, in Newport. And people's status, even when they were enslaved, their status and their sphere of activity could depend a lot on factors like who owned you, what kind of role you played, what kind of skills you had, and... So someone like Caesar Linden, you know, it can be shocking the the kind of lifestyle he seems to have lived, but that's not representative, right? No, Most no. enslaved people no, no. would have been doing very menial work, probably mm-hmm. subject to, you know, brutal treatment. Mm-hmm. But there was an amazing range and variety, yep. right? Yep. And and sometimes it's these remarkably accomplished people who mm-hmm. show up 
most prominently in the record. Right? Yeah, yeah, another example I think would be Zingo Stevens, uh, who is <laughs> one of the first black stonemasons, um, mm. you know, known as the some first black stonemason. Again, enslaved by a stonemason, a stonemason, mm-hmm. John Stevens, who taught Zingo the skill. I think Zingo is a is it birth is what is one of the day names. The, the, the day names. Oh, um, and Zingo goes on with. Um, other other people to form the Free African Union Society. So mm-hmm. he is given that skill, develops that skill, um, becomes prominent in his field um, as a stonemason, and then goes on to help and 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 fi- and assist other people to achieve their freedom um, in the Free African Union Society. I think it's just a, such an incredible story, you know. And 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 to think in some in a time like 1780, 1790. That there are free enslaved Africans in Newport that own property and are actively working to free other members of their community is just yeah. an incredibly fascinating story that has yet to really be told. One, it is. It is really an amazing like narrative. But as for this object that we started from, we don't know who made it. It's possible that with adequate investigation, someone might be able to figure out or deduce who it was looking at the materials, the dates. Uh, it's it's possible, but even without that, we can see there are just huge, rich implications that you can unfold, again, just from this one little hidden bundle of items mm-hmm. under a floorboard in a house in Newport. So thank you so much for unpacking, <laughs> unpacking that bundle. <laughs> well, thanks for having us. me. I think this was a wonderful object to discuss, yeah, and hopefully we will talk more. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.